Hey, welcome to the East Salem Church Podcast channel. We are so glad that you are with us. Here, you will find inspiration direct from the Word of God. So sit back, be inspired, and engage with today's message. Well, good morning, my church family. So this is a continuation of a series that I started quite a while back and didn't realize when I looked at the calendar there was going to be a giant gap after uh, session number three. So let me just give you a quick recap before I launch into today. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. I call it the forgotten third because honestly this is a part of the Godhead that we oftentimes don't learn about, we don't preach about, we don't read about. And it is one of the most important things that we can do as followers of Jesus in our life right now because the Holy Spirit is literally God with us right now. So we need to be able to tap into that Holy Spirit. So we've discovered that the Holy Spirit was the creative power that created the earth and the universe and us. We discovered that the Holy Spirit was the one that transforms us from the inside out so we don't have to worry about conquering all of the crud that's inside of us. He's going to take care of that if we just follow Him and allow Him to do His work. We learn that God doesn't do giant leaps with us. He asks us to do baby steps that oftentimes don't make a whole lot of sense because when the Holy Spirit says take this little step, He's got the long game in mind and we need to just continue to take those baby steps and let us lead. Which brings us to our fourth part of the series today called Download. Now I don't know about you guys, but uh, I grew up in an era where if you wanted to connect to the internet, your computer would make a sound that went... Hello, Dave. You know, something like that. It would connect, and then if you were lucky, you would be able to do a few things. In fact, it was my, my uh, freshman year of college when the internet really started to come into being where you could do crazy things like send an email message in a text editor program that would arrive at the person's destination within a day or two. I'm not making that up. Sometimes they didn't arrive at all, by the way. I'd send, and this is before spam blockers and everything else. I'd send emails off to like friends and stuff that were all over the, you know, the United States at different colleges. would be like, hey, check it out. I'm on the World Wide Web. And they'd, I'd be talking to them like three weeks later and like, I didn't get no mess. What are you talking about? This was the advent of technology. And then, of course, we've grown by leaps and bounds since then. Not only do we not have computers that necessarily make that sound, but we can connect with our cell phones, with our tablets, through the wireless internet of Wi-Fi, satellite, and whatever it happens to be. So in 2013, I moved down to my, my first senior pastor assignment in Milo, Oregon, which a lot of you've heard about already. But one of the funny things that I relate is this. I arrived on July 1 of 2013, so most of the students were off campus. It was just me, a bunch of the staff members that happened to still live on campus during the summer, and a lot of the community folk. And on my first Sabbath there, I remember talking to the community people, and they were so excited to let me know that high-speed internet had finally come to the Milo Valley. And I'm like, 2013, man. What do you mean high-speed internet has finally come? It's been around for a while now. And they're like, no, no, no. Just a couple of months ago, we just had dial-up internet. I'm like, 56K? If you are lucky. I'm like, oh, wow. I'm like, they're like, and then finally Frontier came in and they built it all out. And now we have DSL. Do you, have you heard of DSL? Yes, I've heard of DSL. It's been around a long time now. And they're like, wow. I'm like, wow. So we actually have high speed internet here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, well, how fast is it? Oh, about 500 to 700 K. And I'm sitting there going, all right, I used to do IT management and 700 K is really, really really slow. In fact, I just left a house that's out in the suburbs of Salem where we had DSL that would have given us up to 50 to 60 megabits if we were willing to pay for it, and now we're doing 700K. So for those of you that are not IT inclined like me, let me break it down for you. We measure things in gigabits per second now. So a kilobyte is one million bits less than one gigabit. So here's an example. Just let's put this in a perfect example. If you happen to live in a place that got 700K, 
to download a 20, well, to download a movie, for example, a three, most movies are around three gigabytes, something like that, to download a movie to watch on Netflix would take you about three or four hours for it to buffer enough that you could watch it without it going, right? It's an awesome way to watch a movie, by the way. Yeah, it's wonderful. You're like, oh, here comes the good part. It's awesome. Now that we are here in the advent of the 21st century, maybe you can realize that to download a movie takes mere seconds. So to say that we had high-speed internet in Milo was, well, not entirely accurate, but I guess it's all about perspective, right? So when we got down there in 2014, we were actually able to get a 700K DSL set up in our home. And in 2014, we had a couple of gaming systems that we would play with as a family, and we had the Wii. If you haven't had the Wii before, it was awesome until you club somebody in the head with one of the remotes on accident or let go of one of them and they broke something, and then, yeah, you're in trouble. So we had one of those, but my son had been asking for quite some time. He really wanted an Xbox. And so I'm a cheapskate by nature. I didn't want to pay the full price for an Xbox, which back in the day was about four or five hundred dollars. By the way, they're still about five or six hundred dollars, or if you have to buy them when they're just coming out, probably one or two thousand dollars. So I went on Amazon around Christmas time looking for a deal buster on an Xbox, and I found a refurbished model for 250 bucks. I'm like, score! It's certified by Microsoft. It works just as good as the brand new ones. It, it, somebody broke it. They sent it back to Microsoft under warranty, and now they fixed it by the same guys that put it together, and now I can get it for, for about 50 bucks, maybe a little bit more off. And so I got this thing, and then I ordered what I knew would be our favorite game because Nathan and I are kind of football nerds. We love to, to get into it. We like to, to watch football on Sunday, and sometimes we even get the chance to go down and watch it play out live in a stadium. And so I got Madden, the NFL game Madden. If you don't know what that is, it's, it's computerized football where you play against each other, and it's actually a whole lot of fun. So this Xbox and the Madden game arrive, and I'm excited for Christmas morning because Nathan has no clue. So Christmas morning happens, and he tears open the box, and there's the Xbox and the Madden game, and he's so excited, and I'm like, Dude, we're finally going to get to play some 21st century technology that we was cool and all, but this is really cool, man. I mean, it's got the great graphics, and it's got the latest rosters, so the guys that we're playing with in the football game are all the players that we watch on TV, and we were all excited about it, and so I cleared off a space on the entertainment center, hooked it up to the TV, and plugged it into the internet cable, and plugged it into the wall outlet, and turned it on, and it said, you need to download the operating system. Okay, so got the controller. All right. Okay. Estimated size, 20 gigabytes. I'm sitting there doing the math in my head. 700K, 20 gigabytes. I'm like, this is going to take like a day. And then I'm sitting there going, no, 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 no. Let me redo that math. It's going to take like two and a half days to download this stupid update just so we can play this console. All right, okay. And then you watch the bar go 1%. And then I'd come back like two or three hours later, 2%, 3%. And then something magical happened on day two because you know what's wonderful about rural DSL? It's rural. And it's not good. And sometimes it just goes, I'm going to stop working in the middle of the night. And that's exactly what happened. And because it was downloading the operating system, the, 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 the Xbox console itself didn't know that it could save everything that it downloaded already and just continue on when the signal came back on. It just forgot that it had downloaded anything. And so when the Wi-Fi came back on, it, I turned it back on and it goes, guess what? You need to download an operating system. I'm like, I know. So I do it again and 1%. 2%. Five days later, it finally boots up, and it was glorious. Now, 
I don't know about you, but I'm a, better, a big kid at heart, especially when it comes to stuff like Christmas. Can you imagine opening your Christmas present on, on Christmas morning and being super stoked and excited about it, and then having to wait five days for the dumb thing to actually download the, 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 the operating system just to make it work? So Nathan and I are on pins and needles waiting for this thing to work, and, and, and it's just not happening. By the way, for the record, if I would have plugged it into my internet that I have at home right now, we have 500 megabit internet service. That 20 gigabyte download would have taken five minutes. If you have a hundred megabit, a thousand megabit service or gigabit service as, as Xfinity offers around here, it would have taken you two and a half minutes. So anyway, the five days come and we're looking forward to just really getting into some gameplay. But then we decided, you know what? We've waited a long time. Eh, we're just going to leave it there. We're not going to play anything on it. We just put the controllers away and we never actually turned it back on again. Let's just let us sit there. That would be pretty ridiculous, right? To actually buy this thing, spend all that time downloading the information, loading the game, getting excited about playing together, enjoying the adventure together, laying some wood on each other, let's be honest, and having all kinds of fun with it, but then all of a sudden we're just like, you know what? Eh, we got everything we need to make this thing work, but yeah, whatever, we don't want to do it anymore. And so your friends come over, and they look at it, and you're like, hey, welcome to our home, and all these things, and one of them goes, oh, you guys have an Xbox. Yeah, you got any good games for it? Yeah, we got Madden, whatever it was, 2014 at the time. Yeah, we got that. Cool, can we play it? No, we don't really do that here. We just, uh, we just like to have it around. Uh, it's a status symbol, you know? It, 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 it's the X that glows. It's really cool. Here, I'll turn it on for you so you can see it. Look at that. Yeah, it's cool, isn't it? Wait, you, you, you don't play it? No, no, no. We just like the way it looks on the entertainment console. I mean, it really fills it out, doesn't it? Now, my friends would look at me like you're looking at me now. You're like, he's not serious, is he? They actually play the thing, right? Yeah, we do play the thing. But how wise would it be for me to invest all of that time and all of that money and all of that stress to build this thing and get it ready to go and then not actually use it? It would be, well, not very wise. In fact, a lot of you would probably say it's pretty dumb, a poor investment of time and talent and treasure. Now, here's the irony. While you would probably admit that this is dumb and wasteful, you and I might behave in the same way when it comes to the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit isn't just a cool thing that Jesus sent to you and me after he returned to heaven. The Holy Spirit is the very one who gives you and me the wisdom of God. Now, sure, you can download a whole lot of information and, and gain a lot of knowledge about God through books and podcasts and even reading the Bible or, or devotionals or whatever it happens to be. But let me be clear, knowledge is not the same as wisdom. See, knowledge equals downloading information, having it there. Wisdom equals putting that knowledge into action, actually turning the console on, and playing the game. In fact, dictionary, I looked it up in the dictionary and they had a definition of knowledge versus wisdom that, that I thought was pretty good. And, and here's what it says. I think I have a slide on that one up there, Cameron, if you can find it. The primary difference between the two words of knowledge and wisdom, there it is. There you go. Is that wisdom involves a healthy dose of perspective and the ability to make sound judgments about a subject while knowledge is simply knowing. Anyone can become knowledgeable about a subject by reading, researching, and memorizing facts. It's wisdom, however, that requires more understanding and the ability to determine which facts are relevant in certain situations. Wisdom takes knowledge and applies it with discernment based on experience, evaluation, and lessons learned. And maybe you've heard this quote that they actually attribute here in this citation. A quote by a well-known uh, unknown author sums up the difference as well. Knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing when not to say it. Like when somebody says, do these pants make me look fat? <laughs> Knowledge is... <laughs> 
Wisdom is, you look beautiful. <laughs> Wisdom. An issue that you will face in your faith journey about God is that you can oftentimes focus way too much energy on knowledge, but never progress into wisdom. I'm going to introduce you to the Greek word that is behind these verses and things that we're going to wrestle with today when we talk about this spirit of wisdom. It's actually a name that's probably familiar to you because there are many people on this planet that are named after wisdom, and the Greek word behind it is Sophia. Good name for a little girl, unless your little girl is, well, not wise. <laughs> so, Sophia is the Greek word, and it actually means wisdom. It refers to the quality of having knowledge, skill, and experience in the sense of mastery over a particular subject or trade through practice and learning. So, knowledge is going to college and understanding all the stuff and passing the test that your instructor has given you, and then graduating college or your trade school or whatever it happens to be, and actually putting that into work. Now, my favorite opportunity for this was my very first managerial job was with an aerospace company, and I had a, a bachelor's degree in history, a bachelor's degree in social studies, and a minor in business administration. Oddly enough, it got me a job as a business manager for an aerospace company. Go figure. So I walk in, and the general manager comes into my office on the first day, and I'm setting up pictures and stuff and loading the, the, the computer and setting up my email and loading the accounting software and everything. And he comes in, and he goes, you got one of those fancy degrees about business stuff, huh? He said, I have, a, I have a minor in business administration, yeah. So you probably know a whole lot about accounting and finances and stuff. Uh-huh, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, I do. I know a lot about that stuff. And I kid you not, he leaned over my desk... And he goes, kid, you don't know nothing. And, and then he goes, you have the knowledge on how to do it, but have you ever done it for a multi-million dollar company? No. Well, then I'm going to give you the experience so that you can say, yes, I know how to do it. See, the major difference was, yeah, I had a degree in it, and yes, I had played with accounting software, and I'd sat through finance classes and mostly stayed awake, and, and economics and everything else, and, and I graduated, and I got the degrees and all of that stuff, but when it came to actually now running the business of a big corporation, I had no wisdom, because I had no experience in doing those very things. And I had to learn everything about the aerospace company and then combine it with everything that I knew about accounting and business administration and then put it into practice so that the company would be solvent and successful and actually have cash flow and all the things that you need to be a successful business. Sophia is not just knowledge, it's putting knowledge into action. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the church in Ephesus, talks about this very thing. And in fact, what he says is this, is that wisdom from God is from the Spirit. He calls it spiritual wisdom in the New Living Translation, as you'll see here in a second. Other translations that are a little bit more literal say it is the Spirit of wisdom, as in the Holy Spirit is the one giving the wisdom. So in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, as he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he says some good stuff. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom, or the spirit of wisdom, and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he's given to those he called his holy people who are rich and glorious inheritance. Literally, if you were to look at the Greek behind the, that spiritual wisdom or spirit of wisdom, it's pneuma, which we've been studying for the last three parts of the series. Pneuma is the Holy Spirit. It would say pneuma sophia, spirit wisdom. So when we are talking about wisdom that comes from God, when we are talking about how that operates, how God allows us to experience the things in life that he wants us to know, it's going to come through the Holy Spirit. 
But understand, when this is the spirit of wisdom that is upon us, he's not going to just impart knowledge. He's going to call us to then put the knowledge into practice. The spirit of wisdom is the Holy Spirit compelling us to act on the things that we know about God and that we know about how God desires us to serve. Now, there's nothing wrong with knowledge, but if that knowledge is not applied, faith becomes an academic exercise. It would basically be like someone who's only driven a car while playing the game Grand Theft Auto. Those of you that don't know what that is, go look it up. It's, 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 it's horrible. Don't play it. But Grand Theft Auto is, is the idea is that you're a person in a city and you're operating on the criminal side of things and you steal, kill, and destroy and maim people by driving a car, running them over. It's, 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 it's an awesome game. It's very holistic. But while somebody that plays this on their console, PC, or mobile device may know that a car can go forward, it can go left, it can go right, go in reverse, it can speed up, it can brake, and do all of these things, you probably don't want to just walk over and hand them a driver's license and the keys to your car. Because two things are going to happen. Number one, your car is going to look like the car in Grand Theft Auto when it's done. Dented up, blood spattered, holes in the windshield, like horrible, miserable things are going to happen. The second one is the police are going to come knocking on your door and going, what in the world are you doing giving the keys to this person? Well, they play Grand Theft Auto all the time. They know how to drive a car. No. They know how a car operates. But their idea of driving a car is seeing somebody in a crosswalk in a wheelchair, and that's worth points. It's ludicrous, right? But oftentimes, that's, that's how we approach our faith. If I just know enough, then I will know God. And I will know what He expects of me. And I will know how He's going to transform me. But the problem is, is that knowledge of God is not the same thing as serving God. When we call ourselves Christians, it means we are followers of Christ. And that means the Holy Spirit, when He wants to impart wisdom on us, is going to say, okay, you know Jesus is love, that He is unconditional love. How am I going to give you wisdom on what unconditional love is? I'm going to put you in a situation with somebody that absolutely hates you, and you're going to still have to love them. That's Holy Spirit wisdom. You want to experience the love of God? You've got to be in the situations that Jesus Himself found Himself. In a very practical sense, the spirit of wisdom imparts experience, specifically experience in obeying Jesus, both in your personal life and also in your ministry to others. Because the spirit, just as Jesus did, compels you to serve. In fact, Jesus actually said the same thing. When he was teaching his followers, he was talking about what wisdom isn't and what wisdom is. And it was very specific. You see, wisdom isn't knowing what God wants. Wisdom is doing what God wants. In Matthew chapter 7, he's closing out the Sermon on the Mount, and then he says some stuff, and right after he finishes saying it, a bunch of people leave because they don't like it. And why don't they like it? Well, because he calls them to task. Matthew 7, verse 24, he says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, is wise. Not knowledgeable, not smart, not PhD level. They're wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. I'm going to pause there. Cokes, I don't know how we do it, but every single time you guys do music and we don't even talk to each other, I'm like, cornerstone, solid rock. I'm like, really? <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. That's wisdom, people. So he says this, it's wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Hmm. Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord, our God, 
has given you and I, the Bible, the Word of God, full of His teachings, including practical applications, principles, and knowledge. And the Holy Spirit is going to ask you to act upon those teachings, applications, principles, and knowledge. If you choose not to put into practice the things that you read there, then you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit will lead you to situations where you get to practice what you learn. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, Feed the hungry, house the homeless, clothe the naked, visit shut-ins. But if the Holy Spirit is compelling you to do those very things and putting on your heart and in your mind, you know what? I should go out and help out on Sunday night at Arches. I should go help with safe sleep, with inside out. I should just go downtown and allow God to show me somebody that I can minister to, maybe hand them a gift card to McDonald's and go have lunch with them. Whatever it happens to be, if the Holy Spirit has put that thought in your brain and you choose not to act on it, you say, I know I'm supposed to do these things, but I don't want the wisdom that comes from doing it. In Micah 6.8, God says, do what is right, love mercy, walk with humility, and serve God. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know that I'm supposed to be merciful towards others. I'm supposed to walk with humility, and I'm supposed to serve God. But I'm right. And they're wrong, and they need to know it. Don't we do that on a regular basis? Is that humility? Or is that ego? Is that, is that pride? You see, when the Holy Spirit begins to transform us, He's going to ask us to do things and put us in situations that cause us to change the way that we view the world, the way that we view each other. And we have a choice to make. We can continue to stay in knowledge of, I know He wants me to do that. Or we can move on and allow the Holy Spirit to work within us in a powerful way and choose wisdom and say, now I want to experience it. Amen. See, oftentimes in life, we want to experience the miracles that God has in life. We want to see people walk on water. We want to see people raised from the dead. We want to see people healed because we laid hands and prayed on them. We want to see people all of a sudden come to Jesus and it's a miracle. We want to see people freed from demonic possession. We want to see all of these crazy things like fishes and loaves multiplying, but we don't want to go to the meal. The one thing that you have to remember is this. The catalyst for all of those things happening in the New Testament church is you. By listening to the Holy Spirit's prompting and doing what He asks you to do, you get to be the catalyst for people being healed. You get to be the catalyst for people raising from the dead. Oh, that doesn't happen anymore, Chad. Ah, I met a guy. I have a story. I'll tell you sometime. I want to see fishes and loaves multiplied. I have a pastor friend that witnessed that very miracle because he stepped out in faith. We called it the never-ending rice bowl. They ate rice and it just kept filling back up again for six days. Nobody ever made rice. Craziness. We have to be willing to say, God, I know you, but I want to be wise in you. We know from the scriptures, Malachi 4 especially, that we're supposed to give generously of our tithes and offerings. I've got a whole other sermon I can do on that, but here's the fun part. The Hebrew behind that literally says that you should be joyous or, quote, hilarious givers. You ever seen somebody that's completely lost their marbles before and they're just laughing hysterically? That's what the Hebrew word actually means. It's like, Money? Okay. <laughs> Ooh, some over here, some over here, some over here. Now, I'm not saying go empty your bank account. But if God, the Holy Spirit, is convicting you to be wise in His ways, and He says, look, I see that you got that bonus. I see you got that little extra cash. You see that I've blessed you with this money. You know what? I know you want to hold on to it, but I didn't bless you with the money for you to keep it this time. Instead, I want you to do this. 
I know that I'm supposed to give hilariously and generously, but I could really make good use of that money, God, so I'm going to hold on to it. Knowledge versus wisdom. And I can tell you from first-hand experience and second-hand experience where I've witnessed where people have given away stupid money because God asked them to, and people looked at them and went, no, 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 you need that. Your family needs that. You don't understand. This is, this is not a smart thing to do. This is, and they're like, I don't know what to tell you. I've been praying about it, and God keeps on saying, I need to do this with my money, and so I'm going to do it. And they go ahead and do it. And then like a couple of weeks later, all of a sudden a miracle happens and they are blessed in ways they could never imagine. Not because they manipulated God into somehow blessing them with more money, but because they served God and God said, great, I've seen that you've been wise with what I've given you. I'm going to give you some more so you can be wise with that too. I watched a guy who had been laid off, his unemployment had run out, and he had a $20 bill stuck in his pocket like this at church. And we were collecting the local church budget offering, and I remember him pulling it out, and I was working in the AV booth with him that day, and he pulls it out, and he was signaling to the guys downstairs, because the deacons never came upstairs for some reason, and signaling that, that he wanted to come up because he wanted to put the 20 bucks in, and I looked at him, I said, no, 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 buddy, 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 no, no, no. That's like, no, you don't have any income coming in, man. That's at least a few meals for you. Hold on to that. And he's like, no. The Lord wants me to give this. I'm like, I don't think you understand, man. I, I mean, you can stretch that like $4 a meal. That's like five meals. That's going to get you through at least half the week while, while we help you figure out the other. The Lord is calling me to give. I'm like, oh, I thought he was an idiot. And he put it in the offering basket and didn't think a thing of it. Next Sabbath, we're both working up there again. And he comes in and he's just like skipping. I won't skip because it's... it's That was just for you, Jason. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, Rick, what happened, man? And he's like, oh, I got a story. And it's okay. He goes, remember, I, I, you know, the whole thing, and you called me an idiot. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I thought it was foolish. He goes, yeah, man, but he's like, I let go of that $20. And he's like, it was literally like when it left my hand and went into the offering plate, I felt freedom. Like, that 20 bucks was somehow chaining me back. And I'm like, mm -hmm, okay, doesn't make any sense to me. And he goes, no, no, no. But when I let it go, I felt freedom. I felt peace with it. And he's like, on Monday, I got a call from this employer who I had not applied to, but one of my best friends got a job at, and they were looking for somebody else to come and work the same shift as one of my best friends, and they recommended me. So they called me and said, can you start on Tuesday? Twice the pay that I had at my previous job. I'm like, so started on Tuesday? He's like, no, I turned it down. No, just kidding, I took it. Oh, to do, Rick. <laughs> I'm like, don't mess with me, man. But I look at that, and I'm like, I remember him telling me that story. And this was before I really started focusing back on God's calling in my own personal journey. And I remember going, man, I want to have faith like that. Where I could give my last $20 and not even blink. And as I've studied it and as I've started to live it and integrate it into my life, what I have found is if you follow the spirit of wisdom, you will be given those opportunities. And if you want to experience wisdom, you follow what he asks you to do and you get to see miracles happen. But your loyalty cannot be divided between your own self and what God thinks you should be doing. James, the half-brother of Jesus, actually had some really stern warning. If you ever, ever, ever read through the book of James, I used to hate the book of James because I thought it was very legalistic because he just like hammers on you about stuff in there. And then when I finally got done with it, looking at it through a pastor's heart, I'm like, this is stuff I need to hear. This is good stuff, and it's not legalistic. He's just calling me to account. And in James chapter 1, he has this beautiful piece, and I, I wrestle with this a lot. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. As we discovered, where does that wisdom come from? Where does it flow through? The Holy Spirit. So when you go, God, I need to know what to do in life. I need to know where I'm supposed to go. I need to know what I'm supposed to give. I, know, I need to know how I'm going to serve. He's like, all right, I'm going to impress you with the Holy Spirit 
And he's going to tell you how to take the knowledge that you have, the the gifts that I've given you, and he's going to tell you how to do this. One step at a time. And so he gives. Verse 6, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. That phrase, divided loyalty, jumps off the page at me every time I read it. And it's essentially this. Is Jesus truly the Lord of your life, or just when you deem that his instructions are wise by your standards? If he's asking you to do something, when you say, God, I need wisdom on what job to take, on where to go, on what to, where to move, what to do with my kids, um, you know, how to serve in the local church, you know, all of these things, and you pray, but initially when you're praying, you may say the words or the thoughts, but in your heart you're like, and then I'm going to evaluate whether or not I'm going to follow your advice. The advice you get ain't going to be coming from God, and it's not going to end well. When we pray to God and ask for wisdom, how do you want me to do X, Y, Z? How do you want me to follow you? And we say it with a sincere heart, with a surrendered heart, with the, lo- with the heart of a person who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord, which means he's our ruler, if you will. Then when that wisdom comes down, it's going to sound crazy. But you step into it because of your knowledge and your understanding that this is of the Holy Spirit. But when we decide to evaluate God's wisdom based on our own standards, we really can't point the finger at Adam and Eve, can we? I mean, his wisdom. Don't eat that fruit. Did God know what sin would do? Did he have first-hand experience what happens when somebody chooses a path apart from his kingdom? He saw his best friend choose to stab him in the back, not in a literal sense, but a metaphorical sense, and say, I could run the universe better than you can, God. And Lucifer fell and took a host of angels with him. Did God have wisdom on what happens when somebody chooses to go against what he is asking them to do. Absolutely. And so when Eve took that fruit, it wasn't just Eve saying, it looks shiny and I just, it's going to give me more knowledge. It was, no, no, no. I reject your wisdom and in its place, I substitute my own. Therefore, humanity falls. It's the same thing that we do when the Holy Spirit brings us wisdom, when He brings us Sophia, and He says, I want you to do these things. I'm going to compel you to serve, to take the knowledge, and not just sit on it as an academic exercise and show your superiority and grasp of the biblical concepts. No, 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 no. I want you to live that life. Now here's the kicker. The reason that you and I tend to reject what the Spirit of Wisdom is trying to get us to do is because it sounds downright crazy. Like, give your last $20 today in church, into the offering basket, there you go. Crazy. Some would even say it's foolish. God would never ask me to do that. If you've never read through Hebrews 11, I don't have time to throw it up here, but read through it. It's a wonderful read. It's the Heroes of Faith chapter. And the men and women that are listed in there struggled with this whole concept of wisdom. Not a one of them was asked to do something that was easy. And yet we hold them up as heroes of faith. Men like David or Samson or Elijah or Elisha. Women like Rahab, the prostitute who harbored Jewish spies because the Holy Spirit asked her to, even though it was probably going to cost her and her family their life. God would, he will, ask you to do that. In 1 Corinthians, we get to the, 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 the verses that we have for our verse today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 18, it says this, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. 
But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? Well, God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It's foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those who are called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. This foolishness of God created the universe, including you and me, from nothing. This foolishness of God is what saves us from ourselves through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The foolishness of God transforms us from the inside out through the power of His Holy Spirit. The foolishness of Christ paid the debt for our sins so that we can live eternally with God. The foolishness of Jesus conquered the grave so that death could no longer hold us down. The foolishness of the Spirit asks us to be foolish for the kingdom by joining Him and helping spread the message of Jesus of foolishness to those that He calls to be princes and princesses of the kingdom of God. Living in the Spirit means that we have to live a life following the wisdom of the Spirit. Doing, serving, living as the Spirit teaches you and calls you to act. A little later on in James, in chapter 3, verse 13, he adds the context to asking for wisdom. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom, from Sophia. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, Don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, it is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. The wisdom of God leads you to a life of peace and love. Jesus laid down His life so that you can truly live. Jesus gave you the Holy Spirit so that you can truly live the life that He created specifically for you. Jesus gives you the spirit of wisdom so that you know what you ought to do, how to serve, how to give, how to be a member of the family of God. In her book, The Acts of the Apostles, author Ellen White puts it like this, God is able and willing to bestow upon His servants all the strength they need and give them the wisdom that their very necessities demand. He will more than fulfill the highest expectations of those who put His trust in Him. Today, family, choose to always go beyond the download. Join the adventure that awaits Allow the Holy Spirit to guide your steps, to guide your life, to compel you to serve in ways that you never imagined, and to make your God-sized imprint on this world. Follow Jesus. Love as Jesus loves. Forgive as Jesus forgives. Show grace as He shows grace. Serve as He serves. Family, may we continually move beyond knowledge and instead pursue 
and listen to the spirit of wisdom. Well, thank you once again for taking the time today to be inspired. We'd love for you to leave us a review about this podcast, and we're always going for five stars. We'd also love for you to become a subscriber to this channel so that you're notified as each new episode drops. If you'd like to contribute to supporting this podcast or to learn more about our church, head on over to www.esalemchurch.org. Hey family, wherever life finds you today, may God richly bless you.